proceed, but as correspondent Shane Harm reports, the many hours of studying can come at a price. Ten-year-old Nam Hyun Ju and her younger sister Hyun Jung walk to class every morning. They attend elementary school in western Seoul. Hyun Ju is in the fourth grade and Hyun Jung in grade three. Classes begin at 8.40 a.m. The day is jam-packed with subjects ranging from math and science to English and social studies, not much different from other parts of the world. I like going to school. My favorite subject is physical education. Korean students typically rank in the top tier of OECD evaluations. 97% of high school students graduate. The country's literacy rate stands at 98%. And according to the U.S. Institute of International Education, Koreans comprise the third largest number of international students enrolled at U.S. universities, behind students from China and India. In 2011, U.S. President Barack Obama used his State of the Union speech to tout Korean educators. Let's also remember that after parents, the biggest impact on a child's success comes from the man or woman at the front of the classroom. In South Korea, teachers are known as nation builders. Here in America, it's time we treated the people who educate our children with the same level of respect. Teachers may play a vital role in student performance, but there is also strong support from parents. Daryl Orchard is the headmaster at Dulwich College, an elite British school that opened a branch in Seoul in 2010. He says that for families in Korea, education is everything. In all the countries I've worked in, um, the, the commitment um, and investment in their children's education has been greatest here in Korea. Um, from an early age, uh, they want to work very hard to ensure that their children do get the very best education available to them. After a long day at school, Hyunju and Hyunjung aren't done because there's more learning to do. They walk to a nearby piano school where they will work on improving their music skills. For students in South Korea, learning doesn't end at the final bell. Many attend private learning institutes known as Hubwons into the wee hours of the night. In fact, three quarters of Korean students enroll in these cram schools in an industry estimated at roughly $17 billion. And families here spend nearly a fifth of their total income on education for their children. I have no choice but to send my kids to academies if they want to go to university. They have to go because their friends go. After school learning is where my children have the chance to interact with friends. Critics say Korean students rely on private tutoring in order to make up for deficiencies at schools, which tend to focus on testing and rote memorization. That could explain the strong testing skills, but in the long run may result in waning interest in school and high stress levels. To counter this, educators say a Western-style education also has its benefits. Typically, people um, from countries in Asia will have that great respect for teachers, for headmasters, that great work ethic, that dedication, probably take more risks. Um, they're willing to get things wrong. And as we know, that's very much part of the learning process in making mistakes. For Hyunju and Hyunjung, tomorrow is another work-filled day. Whether the system they study in is ideal, however, depends on your school of thought. Shane Hom for CCTV, Seoul. Joining us now is a scholar, author, reformer, and leading advocate for e-learning, that's the use of electronic media information and communication technologies in education. Professor Okwa Lee has taught at Chungbuk National University for the past 18 years and witnessed e-learning in South Korea since its inception. She joins us from Seoul. And here with us in Washington is Cara Lee, a frequent speaker on education reform issues. She has successfully managed efforts to bring reform to dozens of U.S. states and currently serves as the president of the Center for Education Reform. Thanks to both of you for joining us. Oh, well, let me start with you. As we heard in that report, students in South Korea come under enormous pressure uh, from their parents, from their teachers, and even from the school system to succeed. And I'm just wondering, you know, whether that's the cost they have to pay, these high stress levels, to be successful at school. Yes. I, I feel very sorry for our students in Korea. They work uh, from uh, very early until very late at night. They uh, virtually no time for playing. In fact, if they play, they feel guilty. 
uh, it's a, such a pity. So recently from last year, there is a new system, new policy introduced in uh, middle school, which is called free semester uh, policy. That is, uh, for one semester during the middle school years, which is 15 years, 16 years, 17 years time, uh, without exam, students can uh, explore their career, their past, their uh, future interest uh, without worrying about the uh, uh, exams. Okay, uh, Cora, I'm sorry I called you Cora Lee, that you're of course Cora Cohen. Uh, let's not forget that. Now, we don't appear to have that kind of pressure here in the United States, the pressure to succeed all the time. No, we don't have that, that culture of, of success or quality. In fact, only 34% of our nation's 8th graders can read and compute math at proficiency. Um, so there needs to be a balance between, I think, the two, uh, what's going on in, in um, the rest of the world and what we could be doing better here in the United States, like standards and um, you know, uh, measurement and looking at student performance is, is critical, but uh, we need to be addressing it um, from at the school level. You know, what is going on in the classroom? Do our teachers have the ability to innovate? Um, do our schools have the ability to innovate? This, this focus on testing alone um, isn't helping us reach uh, the potential that, that our students have. You know, uh, in the United States, uh, students here scored 17 in those standardized tests that were carried out. Uh, those were the, I think, the PISA tests. I mean, what do you make of the fact that the United States came 17th among most of the, you know, uh, behind most developed countries? Well, and actually, um, in math, we're 36th. And we spend close to, um, you know, the, probably one of the most, uh, out of all of the, the countries, industrialized nations that are in the, the PISA, um, we spend probably the most. And so what we've learned is that uh, more money, throwing more money at the problem hasn't helped us. So we, we have a real crisis here in the United States that we need to address. Uh, okay, let me go to you again. Uh, South Korea and Finland topped the table as so-called education superpowers, according to a study that was conducted by uh, the Economist Intelligence Unit. Um, and just wondering, how did South Korea do that? Because, you know, when you think about the recent history of your country, uh, in 1945, when the Japanese occupation ended, 78% of South Koreans were illiterate. Well, um, to us, that uh, high performance in PISA is surprising. We couldn't believe that uh, we achieved that high. We always think our system is not complete, it's not perfect. We feel that our system has a lot of uh, defects. Um, I think uh, we have a strong culture for um, working hard, pay off. If you work hard you will, uh, and sacrifice your uh, pleasure now, uh, your future will be paid off. And we, we have that ethic. And our students have an a interesting attitude that if you fail, if you do not do well academically, it's because of you. It's not because of the system. The students blame themselves and not the system or other uh, parents, other uh, factors. So uh, for them, uh, failure uh, academically means you didn't do a good job and you should do a better job. You, the students have a greed. Students have a, a very um, uh, devout mind for uh, uh, working hard. Okay, Cora, is it very different in the United States? Because here there always seems to yeah, be, yeah, uh, I... uh, I'm sorry, uh, we always seem to be looking for, to blame somebody else right. for what's happening at schools. You know, it could be the fact that the unions involved among teachers, the fact that the superintendents who want different things for their schools, uh, charter schools, traditional schools, etc. Uh, very little blame is placed on the actual students. Right, well, you know, I'll start back at that, that culture of um, success. It's not cool to be a high achieving student in the United States. In fact, sports or other um, extracurriculars are, are given more emphasis. Um, and so th there is a, a real shift that needs to happen in, in, in culture and society. Um, the, the fact of the matter is, and, and there's so much proof and evidence, especially with uh, charter schools and, and some of the reforms that have been happening, that all school or all children, regardless of their zip code, their race, their income level, 
can learn if given the ability or um, you know, inspired to do so. But our culture of, of complacency that happens because we focus too much on the inputs, that's what makes the adults happy rather than the outputs, which is what leads to student success. Okay, talk to us about the role of teachers in the United States, because, you know, we often hear that teachers are not given the recognition they deserve. They're underpaid for one. Well, it's not necessarily underpaid. It's the structure in which, which teachers have to operate. Um, they do not have the ability to innovate in their classroom. In fact, they they have to jump through, um, you know, loopholes and 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 you know considerable obstacles just to make one little change in their classroom because it is controlled from this very top-down uh, bureaucracy that happens at the district level, at the state level, and of course, you know, in the school itself. Um, teachers don't have uh, the freedom to choose um, and they don't have and they are not treated as the professionals that they are because they are stuck in these collective bargaining units so they aren't paid you know these master teachers um, are getting the same pay as, as a teacher who, who might not have the experience or the ability to turn a classroom around it's because of our, our union structure and, and collective bargaining and actually tenure laws um, that do not value the teaching profession in the United States Okay. Oh, well, what about the role of teachers in South Korea? Because in the 60s and 70s, you actually had a shortage of teachers, but now teaching in South Korea is a highly regarded profession. It's very sought after. Teachers are well looked after. To what extent have they contributed to the success of uh, education in South Korea? Uh, the quality of the education cannot uh, surpass the quality of teachers. And we are lucky to have very good quality uh, teachers. The students at a school of education always get the best students in, at the university. Uh, we have uh, the teaching uh, as a job in Korea is highly uh, regarded and well paid. And uh, they are uh, uh, officers, they are public servants. So their job is guaranteed until they retire. So uh, they, they, uh, a lot of talented uh, students uh, prefer to have a teaching job for their uh, uh, lifelong career. So the quality, uh, keeping the quality of the uh, teachers uh, is the, one of the, uh, I think, one of the uh, important elements for our success in education. Okay, Carol, I want to talk quickly about the role of technology in education in the United States. Has the United States fallen behind when it comes to the use of technology in schools? Absolutely. Uh, we talk about it at a very superficial level. Um, the ability for teachers to really innovate and fuse technology in the classroom has, has yet to reach the limits or um, the potential that it has. Uh, we talk a lot about bringing devices. Well, the device is as good as, as the person or the, the you know people using it and, and the, the content that's behind it. Um, we have laws, broadband laws in a lot of states that, that make it impossible. But the potential to reach children, to have a teacher in, you know, a, a, a great science teacher in, let's say, Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia, helping a student in one of the more rural areas where they wouldn't be able to attract that teacher, the potential is incredible if, if we could use technology and online learning in, in new ways to reach uh, the critical mass. Look, we have an influx of 11 million new bodies, new students that will be coming to uh, the United States education system in the next 15 years or so. That's based on the U.S. Census Bureau data. Our current system and structure can't handle that. So unless we get with the game and get with the program, we better um, start thinking about how to use technology in, in more ways than, than we are right now. Okay. Okay. I want to get the view from South Korea. We don't have too much time, but you know, South Korea is regarded as one of the most wired societies on earth. Almost everyone has access to the internet. And how big a role has that played uh, in the education system in your country? Uh, when the uh, uh, internet and I, uh, ICT was introduced in uh, school system, we had a choice uh, whether we decrease the size of the uh, classroom size or provide the technology in schools. And we chose the policy to provide the technology in schools. And providing the technology in schools means uh, a lot in many ways. Uh, the ubiquitous learning became uh, available uh, anywhere, anytime. Students can have access to the quality content. 
and we have an EBS, Educational Broadcasting System, which provides the quality contents for free to the public. So students in a remote area who doesn't have a proper uh, uh, teaching staff can also have access to a quality content. Okay, that's where we have to leave it. Okwali Karakowen, thanks for joining us. When we come back, the track...